Hello and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Susanna Cray. I'm the Senior Vice President at the Sisters of Charity Health System and also the President of the Sisters of Charity Foundation of Cleveland. Both of these organizations carry forward the mission of the, of the founding sisters who came from France in 1851 to meet unmet health, education, and social service needs in Cleveland. The sisters have a rich history of being educators in our community. This commitment to education continues today and most notably through the efforts of the Cleveland Central Promise Neighborhood. The Promise Neighborhood is a transformative program that wraps children in high quality, coordinated health, social, community, and educational support from the cradle to college and career. This collaborative initiative is led by the Sisters of Charity Foundation of Cleveland, and on behalf of this effort, I'm pleased to be here today to introduce to you author and professor David Kerp. David is the James D. Marver Professor of Public Policy at the University of California at Berkeley. He is a former newspaper editor and policy consultant, as well as an academic. His interests range widely across policy and politics. In his 17 books and, many, and his many articles published in both the popular press and scholarly journals, David has tackled some of America's biggest societal problems, including affordable housing, access to health, gender discrimination, and AIDS. His main focus, though, has been on education and children's policy from cradle to college and career. David's latest book is Improbable Scholars, The Rebirth of a Great American School System and a Strategy for American Education. It chronicles how a poor urban district, which was at one time the second worst district in New Jersey, has transported Latino immigrant children, many of them undocumented, into the education mainstream. Now, 90% of those youngsters are graduating from high school. 75% are going to college. The book takes the reader from the third grade classroom to the administrative headquarters where the crucial system building gets done. It also explores the potent politics of the community. Significantly, the book shows how the lessons from this school district can really be applied nationwide. It has been very well received and just last week was awarded the Outstanding Book Award from the American Educational Research Association. Overall, David's work with government agencies and foundations, as well as his teachings and his community activism, address education issues at the ground level. Another of his books is Kids First, Five Big Ideas for Transforming the Lives of Children. It makes a powerful argument for building systems of support that reach from cradle to college and career. This influential piece won the National School Board Journal Award for the best education book in 2011. From the beginning of David's career as a professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and, the, and as the founding director of, Har of the Harvard Center for Law and Education, children's issues have been a main focus for David. Today, David will be in a conversation with City Club CEO Dan Malthrop. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Professor David Kerp. That's a, a very impressive introduction, Sue Cray. Thank you so much. But um, David, is it all true? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. There's some clones out there who I think <laughs> wrote some of those 17 books. Yeah, that's a that's a that, it's phenomenal. The the thing First that's one was published when I was eight, of course. Of course. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well done. Um, the uh, and congratulations on the outstanding book award from Thank the you. AERA. That's a very big deal. You must be quite proud. I am proud and amazed because it's actually a readable book. <laughs> <laughs> not not characteristic of my colleagues. Um, that's part of what makes it outstanding, I suppose. Right. <laughs> I'm delighted. 
Yeah. The, um, the statistic that Sue just mentioned is the one that blew my mind when I was reading your book, Improbable Scholars, <coughs> um, that, that this district in Union City, New Jersey, which is right across the, the Hudson from Manhattan, just north of Hoboken, um, that this district went from being the second worst school district in New Jersey, saying, thank God for Camden, right. um, to, being, um, to being one of the best school districts in New <coughs> Jersey with a 90% graduation rate. Um, I, 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 I'm still, it's sort of speechless. It's a 25-year story, and that's what we're going to talk about. But how did you discover Union City? How did this book get started? Well, first, I want to thank you for, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I took a look at the Hall of Fame wall. I feel appropriately humbled. Um, Union City um, has an amazing early education program. And in writing the book that's actually available, Kids First, one of those five big ideas, they're not new ideas, there's big ideas, is doing really important early education work for kids, helping kids uh, before they actually get to kindergarten. And I was looking for places to go because a lot of the work I do starts with stories and works its way out. Went to Union City, fell in love with the program that they have. By the way, Arnie Duncan visited that program a couple of weeks back. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we can talk more about that. But I, there I was, and I thought, these guys are also doing well in terms of test scores. I didn't have, the graduation rates were not there yet. So I thought, I'm going to go, I'm in this school, I'll just go wander around. It's a K to eight school. And every place I went, I found good teaching, I found some great teaching. I didn't find the kind of, you know, slacker teaching where the teacher's reading a newspaper or showing a movie or what have you. And then and, and anytime else, nobody was pointing me to classrooms. I went to where I wanted to go. So I was, you know, struck by the how did this district. So it's not only, it is, it is the district with the second highest number of free and reduced price lunches in the state of New Jersey. And again, think about, you know, what's there. It would be the highest, except for the fact that probably a third of the people there are there without documentation. Parents are scared that if they, you know, raise their hands, somebody's going to get deported. Um, so that's what, that's what sort of set it up for me. I wanted to understand this, and the district basically gave me a passport. You know, it said, you go any place, wherever, we're not going to, you want to hang out with the mayor who is, I describe him as a cross between, between uh, Boss Daly and Mother Teresa. Uh, um, <laughs> that's he is, Brian Stack. That's Brian Stack. He is, a, he is an astonishing character. Also doubles as a state senator. Also doubles as, a, and, and would have described himself as, He's always, whoever the governor is, he's the governor's best, best friend. And I don't know, you know where he is on the Fort Lee issue, but uh, that's a... That's he's just, that's he, I'm sure he's just glad he, I'm sure he, he, had, right. he never lived there. I'm yeah. sure, yes, Fort Lee is, I mean, everything is close to everything else. I mean, that's mm -hmm. five miles away, so... Um, um, and, you know, so I spent a year, and I started... I mean, I wanted to be in a third grade classroom of kids, newcomer kids, because this district, 75% of these kids... Uh, come from families where Spanish is the language of the home. And so you have a group of kids who are learning English the same time they're prepping for that first big state test. And I lucked out, um, and I talk in the book about this amazing woman, Alina Bospali, uh, and, and the kinds of small miracles that she worked in that classroom. And worked my way out from the classroom to the school, from the school to other schools in the, in the district, spending time trying to figure out how the whole place was glued together by a very effective administration and how the whole nested within a pretty complicated cultural community and, and a political community. Give us a sense of the, the, the demographics. You, you, you mentioned some of the demographics of Union City that, that we understand, high immigrant population, high, you know, lots of free and reduced lunch, high poverty. Um, how big is the district? How so many schools are we talking about? We're talking about 15 schools. Um, we're talking about uh, 12,000 12, students, so not incomparable to Cleveland, which I gather has about 35,000 students in the public Roughly. So, so surprisingly, you know, germane in that conversation. Um, but I do want to say this about one other statistic about poverty. This is the most crowded city in America. It's 1.3 square miles. It's not crowded because it has skyscrapers. It doesn't. It's crowded because you've got lots of families in three and four bedroom apartments, the family, the three kids, the mom and dad, in a room, locked door, one shelf in the refrigerator. So that's, that's what crowded and poverty means in that, in that town. You're talking about multiple families in a single three exactly. or four bedroom apartment. Exactly, so you've got 12, 15 people living in an apartment. 
And so p one of the miracles was that these kids actually, given the lives they were leading and, and the stuff that they would take for granted, the, mm -hmm. the very scary stuff they would take for granted in the community, that they made it to school and did obviously did a lot more than making it to school, did really well. So 25 years ago, in the middle of the 80s, they were, they were saying, you know, looking at Camden and saying there, but for the grace of God and, you know, and a few test scores, right? right. Um, what happened? How did, that, how did things begin to change there? Well, at any district, and I, I moved beyond you know, sort of the end of the book to talk about the strategy that they used turns out to look like the strategy that a lot of other successful urban districts have used. Um, there's always some kind of a crisis moment. And the crisis moment was the state said, we'll give you one year to clean up your act or we're going to take over your school system. Uh, and this is back in the late 1980s when state takeover was, was an unheard of concept. Um, and they did take over the Camden schools. Um, and so the district did what it winds up, what it tends to do generally. It looked, it didn't look to one of those high-priced consultants that we were talking about earlier. It looked inside and found in the middle of its bureaucracy a guy who'd been there for a lot of years who knew two things. He knew how to do bilingual education and he knew a lot about literacy programs. And this is Fred Carey. This is Fred Carey. Uh, and it's important to understand that he, he plays a very key role in the story, but he's not Superman. I mean, they were smart That's enough. The mayor. That's the mayor. That is the mayor. <laughs> that is the mayor. That is the mayor. If you ever go to Union City, uh, and you know, I was, I was sitting on this kind of a conversation with uh, uh, the new chancellor of schools in New York City, and she said, can I go over there? I said, they'd love to have you. So, um, the high school is like a um, shark in that town. It is the most spectacular school that I've ever seen. The football field is hollowed out from the middle of the school with a stadium sort of built in because of the crowded nature of that community. That's Superman. Uh, made that happen. Made yeah. that happen, absolutely. Um, so, the, so, but 25 years ago, yeah, the, it, was, it was under threat of state takeover. Right. And a very highly politicized community. This is a community that, you know, whose mayor was sent to jail for major corruption. This is, this is the community from which Senator Bob Menendez hails and has stayed very involved in what's going on. So a very, it's Hudson County, for those of you who know sort of what, you know, what Hudson County politics or make, make Cook County politics look kind of gentle um, <laughs> um, by comparison, you know. And, um, and, and, yeah. and the governor at the time, this was post Tom Kane around Christy Todd Whitman, is he, that? No, I'm, I'm actually not remembering who, the, it might well have been Kane uh -huh. who was there at the time. Christy comes later, in, later, later right. in, this, in this story. But what he and a group, he gathers a group of talented teachers and they, this is a district that always relies on its own. It always finds its own. And one of the lessons in the story, to me, was teacher, uh, teachers in Union City, and I dare say many of the teachers in Cleveland, are homebodies. They went to school, they, they grew up, were born, went to school, went off to college, came back, started a family, started teaching, all within 100 miles. And, you know, as, a, as an outsider to that world, I thought, you know, these people went to, many of them went to schools that I never heard of, and I used to write about higher education. What are they going to be like? And they're fabulous. I mean, I, my standard when I go into a school is real simple. It's the golden rule. Would I want a child that I love to be in this environment? And there are many, many of those teachers who come from no account schools and who had slacker high school careers uh, who just are amazing in terms of what it is that they, that they do. How did Fred Kerrig, who was this kind of key player in the, in the 1980s and 90s, in, he was promoted to take on the role of, of leading the reform. Right. How did he do it? Well, he brings together this group of teachers and he says to them, we're not going to start by picking textbooks. We're going to start by reading the research. And then we're going to map backwards. So what do we know about how you effectively teach you know, non-English speakers to, to learn the language? And OK, what can we find out there by way of materials? And typically for Union City, it's not one book. It's we're going to take a bit of this and a, a bit of that and put it together that actually works. Um, and again, what do we know about literacy? What do we know about teaching kids um, how to enjoy and understand language? And those, you know, these are kids, again, most of them are coming to school speaking no English, um, certainly to preschool not speaking English. And the, there's a really interesting piece of research which shows that poor kids, have heard 32 million fewer words than kids from professional families. 
32 million fewer words. And that translates, if you don't do something about that right away, that translates pretty, that's a huge detriment to have to, have to overcome. So you walk into those schools and the legacy of Fred Carrig is there is art on the walls with stories there. You walk into any classroom, they're beginning every day by journal writing or essay writing. They're doing cross-curricular stuff, so you're in science or you're in math and you're also writing. Um, and some of the teachers, and I was lucky to, to be with one of them, Alina, really loves writing. So she's going to give them the $20 words as opposed to the 10 So you get beyond sad, bad, mad, mm -hmm. glad, mm -hmm. um, to you know, exuberant and you know, language like that. Um, and he started at the bottom, which is where you have to start. There wasn't preschool at that point, but the first, place to, the first places to work at were kindergarten and first, and first grade. And then year by year, you'd add a year or two, a grade or two in that, in that system. Um, and teacher buy-in and administrator buy-in came in some part, some good part, because it wasn't some outside consultant coming in and saying, here's the, here's the panacea. It was people in the system who'd done their homework and whom the teachers and the parents knew mm -hmm. in the community saying, here's what we come up with. I thought you couldn't do reform without hiring the Boston Consulting Group. Oh, uh, well, what can I say to you? <laughs> they did reform, they did reform, on, the, they did reform on, the, on the cheap. Um, I, never mind. There's a, yeah, there's anyway, a, probably, not, probably not, an inappropriate we're not gonna, joke. We're not going to okay. go there. Okay. Um, the, and so, so he slowly gets, I mean, not every teacher came on board, but enough teachers come on board so that, uh, and, and you're starting with the early grades and growing it bit right. by bit over time. Yep. Um, and that seems so commonsensical. Why is Union City the, the place where it works? Well, I think the, the, the sort of big takeaway, and you know, everybody will, you know, will hear the story as you know, the, the, the punchline which got stolen during that wonderful introduction. You know, <laughs> here's this town, poor you know, immigrant, lots of illegal folks, 90 plus percent graduation rate, 75 percent of those kids going on to college. I think they have more Gates Millennium scholarships, which is 10 years free ride to any place, than anywhere. I mean, they just, they wind up with one or two of those a year. It's fabulous. Um, that they, what they did is stuff that any educator with a pulse knows will work. That's the good news. There's nothing fancy in there. They actually, I, they, they were part early on of a, a study um, that NSF was involved in, seeing whether having laptops, giving kids laptops would make a difference in their attitude. And it was fascinating because when they, when they did this, right, when they handed these kids laptops, there were people out in the world saying, are you crazy? They're going to sell these things. I mean, and not a mad idea. These are poor kids. Not a computer got, got, got stolen. The experiment showed that kids were marginally more excited when they were doing this. They kept the computers. The parents got engaged. So NSF asked me to come talk to them because they were proud parents of this, of this school system. And I said, you know, Union City knows how to use technology. But it, technology has, you know, there's a place for technology, but technology needs to be kept in its place. And if I were, if a computer had never been invented, I'd be here telling you about Union City schools. And I think basically you start with, you know, supporting parents and connecting with the community in a very heavy, thick way. A really good two-year early education program. New Jersey is blessed because it's court ordered uh, that the poor urban districts be provided with funding for two years of early education. But How do we a lot get a court order like that here? There you go. <laughs> but the thing is, a lot of places got that money and frittered it away. And uh -huh. they, the, out of, in a community that has 35 former daycare centers and child care centers, where a third of the kids, only a third of the kids can go to the, to the publicly run schools, they built a system, an early education system talk, that's good across the Talk them. about that, because last week we, here at the City Club, we were talking about the county's wishes and, and interest in creating universal pre-K throughout Cuyahoga County. So we're a county of 1.1, 1.2 million people. Um, that's a lot of universal pre-K. But there's some lessons in Union City's experience. How did they, how did they do it? Well, I, I do want to say that it's really important to get beyond the headlines, right? We talk about universal high-quality preschool, but that means who are the teachers going to be? How are they trained? How is what they're doing integrated with what's going on before? How are they going to be integrated with what's going on in, in K-3? to What kind of respect do they have? How do you engage parents in that, in that process? It's a big deal. Um, I'm a believer in, in um, it's kind of, kind of targeted universalism. I would say you start with the schools most in need and you work your way out so you know where you're going. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know any kid who's not going to benefit from good early education, but I know the kids in greatest need are going to benefit most. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I'd say, um, and I'm about to do a, a piece for the nation about this, is before you celebrate age four, remember that statistic I gave you. Those kids are coming to school with a huge language deficit. And there's recent research that shows as, as early as 18 months, you find a similar gap, and it's almost doubled by 24 months. <coughs> so, you know, it's a harder political lift to think about infants and toddlers, but it's crucial. And it will, the great mistake that I fear New York is gonna make, and that perhaps the state will make, is it will say, aha, here's the panacea. It's early education. Well, believe that, you know, the schools out there, hopefully the schools out there will get better, but it doesn't matter because look at the data. It shows how well these kids have performed, and the right. earlier stuff doesn't matter because look at the miracle that's happened here. And, and those are really two things that, that advocates for kids need to pay attention to. Look at infants and toddlers, and again, sort of keep that concentration on what's going on in the, in the schools. Union City had um, some preschools and it had a lot of mom and pop daycare yep. centers that were that through this process were converted into something approaching high quality early childhood education. Yep. How did they do that? And it's quite amazing. I went into <coughs> one of those schools because I again I could go any place I wanted, and I went. If you run a school system that you're proud of, you'll show the challenges. You'll show the problems. So I was taken to a preschool that had a bad reputation in the elementary school that I was at. Kids were problem kids. That's where they had gone. And I went there and, and heard about a place where, you know, the woman who was running it was a businesswoman from Ecuador, and her notion of, you know, a thing to do is to have candles, lighted candles, all around the floor and tables of this room. Just think about that. <laughs> Three-year-olds, lighted candles, come on. <laughs> you know, nobody died. That's the bottom line. There. Nobody died. So it's a um, small panic attack. Thing. Yeah, and so, you know, what, I mean, they had, what, those schools were obliged to have a lead teacher who had a BA in, in training in child development. But the school system used its coaches, its master teachers from preschool, who would spend a day a week, two days, as long as it took to work with those teachers to get them to do really good things. It's, this is also, it's a work in progress. But you can go now to most of those former child care centers that I would have said were safe until I heard the candle story, and not even that. Uh, and you wouldn't know whether you were in you know, the Bida Wee Child Care Center or the basement of St. Ignatius you know, Church Preschool or the, the school run by the city or the, or the great state-of-the-art school run by the district. They're really good. Um, and that, again, building a mini system with 34, 35 preschools, it's a huge challenge. So the, as I said, the good, the good part of the news about Union City is that there's nothing that they're doing that you didn't know was a good idea a generation ago. It's all pretty straightforward stuff. You want to you teach, teach kids who don't speak English, you teach them their home language first because if they can't be literate in that language, they're always going to have the shaky foundation from which English comes. And I sadly live in a state in which ideology, you know, Trump pedagogy, and it can happen. And, you know, it puts, us, it puts us behind the eight ball. Literacy, the notion, there's a big fight between the look, say, the phonic stuff and the, and the whole book stuff, reading great things, pronouncing letters. I mean, these guys just battle each other. Union City very typically said, this is silly. I mean, of course kids should be reading great stuff. And of course they need to understand, you know, that the, that, you know, that, that letter, what letters sound like and what they sound like in both languages. The other thing that they managed to do, and I, I only came to this realization I think after the book came out, and I was in a conversation with somebody in, in special education. In special education, you may know every child has an individualized education program, an IEP. Well, I would say that in Union City, they essentially every child has an IEP. Every child is treated as an individual. So that, for example, in this elementary school, when kids were moving from one grade to the next, the principal would sit down with the teachers and talk to everybody else who might know these kids. And she would know these kids. And we're talking about a school of 800, you know, a, K to six, a pre K to six, 800 student school. And then she'd do party planning. You know, this kid needs a teacher who's going to give the kid a, a, a hug. That one needs a kid, a teacher will give him a kick in the pants, right? These kids fight with each other. These kids really work well together. Um, you, you're building little communities. She spends a month of her time doing that. And she says about half the kids, it doesn't matter. You can put them any place and they'll do fine. But for, for half the kids, it makes a huge difference. And the same thing is true 
when they start talking about the youngsters who show up from the Dominican Republic or Guatemala or Salvador when they're 13, 14, 15, and they have very little language and maybe a third grade education, and they're in a new country. You know, how do you, how do they take those kids? They've got four years to teach those kids Spanish, to teach them English, to teach them all the academic stuff that they've missed, and to teach them America, because that's half of those kids, half of those kids graduate from high school. You might say, half, that isn't so great. Take a look at the graduation rate for the Cleveland Public School System, or the Buffalo Public School System, or the Syracuse Public School System. That's the graduation rate territory we're talking about. And look at that population of kids. Three of last year's top 20 students were students who'd come five years earlier knowing no English. And they weren't students who came from great professional families who could, um, that's, and you talk to those kids. Mm -hmm. It's not as though all they did was study, study, study. They were the president of this and the vice president of that and the treasurer of this, played on the soccer team. They became included one by one in the school. Mm -hmm. Same thing with special needs kids. Instead of saying, we're going to fill our classes and then we'll stick the special needs kids in you know, where we can, they start with the special needs kids, figure out s this child is going to do just fine in class A, needs a lot of help, somebody else in the classroom in class B, needs special attention in, in subject C. And then they work the rest of the program around that. So it's, it's, it's you can't, it's, it's you've got to keep your eye on the ball. You know, you edu educators know all this stuff. There's absolutely nothing controversial in any of it. It's the doing of it. You know, it's sort least, of, it sort of sounds like it's, it's about how, how these individuals conceive of their own jobs. Yes. And their own responsibility. Well, I think also the fact that they have capitalized on the fact that this is a community in which many of the people, you know, many people were born there, many mm -hmm. of them still live there, or they live nearby, they went to school in the area. So when they talk about our kids, they mean our kids in some, in some more little, in some way that a Teach for America teacher, with much fancier credential, could never do. And these teachers stick around, unlike the Teach for America teachers who come and go. Our, I'm smiling, and, and other people are smiling, because our, our district CEO, Eric Gordon, constantly refers to my kids, my kids. Mm -hmm and he, he feels very passionately in that way that you identify. Um, some people will have undoubtedly criticized Union City for teaching to the test. Union City, and I was out looking at a couple of schools today. Um, one an intergenerational school, one a K to eight school now, which is gonna be a K to K through four, pre-K to four school. Um, and nothing was happening. And why was nothing happening? It's test prep time. And there's a chapter in the book, um, the beginning of the book, I'm in this classroom and I'm telling you what's happening in that first semester and how kids are coming along. Then I move to the, to the school and I talk about the, the great door I images, illustrations, creativity that goes on to celebrate Christmas. And then I go back and look at other places. I come back to the school and I talk about the chapters called Where Fun Comes to Die. Yeah. And that's this time. Fun comes to die. And you look in these classrooms, I said, why are those, you had people with desks in one of the classrooms, the desks are facing the wall. What's with this? Well, some kids, you know, feel that, you know, they'll concentrate better for those exams. You see a set of rules on the board that, you know, would have been, you know, familiar rules in the 19th century. Why? Because that's part of what the test stuff is. So that's, mm. that is Union City. If you went to Union City now, right now, in the elementary schools, you'd get a lot of the same stuff. And the dance that teachers do and that the system does is how do you keep the test scores up? Because that's, that is Union City's claim to fame initially. It was our test scores are better than the, the state of New Jersey's statewide average test mm -hmm. scores. And then you get the graduation rates. And how do you do that without killing student enthusiasm? And it's a, it's a dance it's a, that teachers are forced to do. You look at your kids one day and you say, the hell with it. Th their eyes have glazed over. We've just got to take a break from this and, and do mm -hmm. something else. But it's, it's a you, really unfortunate choice to put them to. You write, though, th I can sense that you are, um, have some mixed feelings about high-stakes testing. You write that it's tempting to damn, it, to damn testing as the killjoy of American education, but the reality is more complex. Absolutely. So I, well, remember I where all this comes from. You know, the whole emphasis on literacy and numeracy comes from the fact that these are, right, the keys to success. Um, and 
in the best phrase that George Bush's speechwriters ever wrote for him, it's a way of addressing the soft bigotry of low expectations, the so which meant those kids, right? They, you can't expect much from those kids. Now, everybody knew who those kids was. Well, No Child Left Behind, the one major piece of bipartisan domestic legislation passed in the Bush administration. Ted Kennedy was its big sponsor in the, in the, in the Congress because this was meant to be gap closing. And you want to make sure that that excuse isn't there, but there's, you know, researchers will talk about type one and type two errors, and this has definitely become a type two error. You're, you focus on a very narrow range of activities, and so that's what gets focused on. And the real tragedy is that the poorer the community, the more the emphasis on those tests, which means the less exciting the teaching, which means the more likely it is that kids will get turned off. If you live in a well-to-do suburb, those kids have enough cultural capital that a school system can be much more louche about how much attention it pays to those tests, because they're going to get it through the work that they're doing. If you're in a place, if you're in Cleveland or if you're in, and you're in Union City, you can't do that because, you know, the state and the feds are going to come down on you like Thor. And that's, you know, they've got the balance wrong. I was, after Improbable Scholars came out, I did a bunch of, um, talks and I went to the, to the top officials in the education department. Um, and when I was leaving this conversation, the um, woman who has been Arnie Duncan's chief of staff, she just left, said, you know, we're just realizing how powerful incentives are and how we need to get it right. I thought, well, it's, you know, on the one hand, I don't want to laugh or cry, <laughs> great, great that you got it, you know, I mean, but anybody, right? A, you know, a three-year-old would know that, you know, if we give you a, you a, know, a cookie to, whatever, to do yeah. this, you're more likely to do it than if you don't. Um, so that's, that's the problem. We've gone way, we have gone way too far. And I do, my sort of final comment on tests is uh, Common Core. Common Core as a set of standards, great. And, um, you know, a ways of thinking, ways of problem solving. Common Core as a set of exams that haven't been as they say, beta tested, jam down people's throats with no time to prepare, or as I gather is going to happen here, you're going to go back to the old test because the new tests aren't ready. It's all about the system distrusting school people. The guy who's the superintendent of Montgomery County. Um, Maryland. Maryland. We have one here. 14th, I'm oh, sorry, 14th okay. biggest school district in the country, uh, very rich and very poor in the same district, said, you know, we ought to, great, well, give us three years to implement the Common Core curriculum, and you develop tests, and we'll do this. Arne Duncan's response was, he's an armchair critic. I mean, he's an armchair, he's the superintendent of schools in the 14th biggest school district. I mean, that's an armchair critic. So we really are in this moment of distrust, and I, and I fear that the consequences of that are that it extracts, it squeezes too much out of the, of the joy out of teaching and learning. I, I don't think too many people would push back when you say that. Uh, we're going to pivot into the questions from all of you now. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we're enjoying a Friday forum with David Kerp. He's the author of Improbable Scholars and Kids First. He's also a professor at the Goldman School of Public Policy at the University of California at Berkeley. Go Bears. We will return to our speaker momentarily for our traditional City Club question and answer Tribe, period. Also. <laughs> and go tribe, yes. We encourage you to formulate questions for our speaker now. Remind you, please, that your questions should be, in fact, questions and brief and to the point. We welcome all of you here and those joining us through our primary media partner, 90.3 WCPN, 104.9 WCLV and WVIZ PBS IdeaStream, or one of the many other radio stations across the country that carry City Club programs. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. Next Friday, April 11th, please join us as we welcome Jonathan Jarvis, the director of the National Park Service. For more information about any of our upcoming programs or any of our past programs, please visit us online at cityclub.org. Today we welcome guests at tables hosted by Baker Hostetler, the Center for Educational Leadership at Cleveland State University, and PNC Bank. Thank you all for your support. Today's program is part of the Education Innovation Series sponsored by a generous grant from the Nordson Corporation from the Nordson Corporation Foundation, excuse me, and also sponsoring today's program are the Sisters of Charity Health System and the Cleveland Transformation Alliance. Thank you very much for your generous support. Today's program is also the Aaron H. and Ruth S. Zychik Forum, made possible by a generous gift from the estate of Aaron and Ruth Zychik. We thank you for your support as well. 
Now we would like to return to our speaker for the traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from all of you, including guests. Holding our microphones today are Development Associate Mike Cromaldi and Marketing and Outreach Specialist Kirsten Pianca. Our first question. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Kerb. I need to tell you, I'm a 40-year retired Cleveland teacher. I loved your book. And I didn't say it. She <laughs> said it. <laughs> I, I, think I loved the, it too. Man. What I loved about the book is that you actually gave so many classroom uh, details of being in the classroom and you didn't just deal with the research. And I love that. Um, here in Cleveland, we have a mayor who chose to go to the business community to design a, an education plan for Cleveland schools as opposed to trusting teachers to do it. And what that has done is created a uh, plan where low performing schools, teachers have to reapply for their jobs. And so you can imagine the morale of our teachers. So in your book, you talk about the importance of those close relationships between teachers and families and community. Can you talk more about why that's a bad idea to have teachers reapply for their jobs in low performing schools? So we all know that there are bad teachers in the schools. And I, I mentioned, you'll recall, you may recall in that book, and this was a shocker to me. I'm such a naive outsider. The best guess of everybody is 10% of teachers hate kids. <laughs> this was an, an, an astonishing notion and, and, in the, and in this district. But the people who are most angry about bad teachers are teachers. Are the good teachers. Are the, the good teachers, teachers in the same, you're in the school. And these are the teachers who are the slackers. These are the teachers who are, who are not giving the kids what it is that they deserve. So in every place that I know where, so you want to be able to have a mechanism that weeds out those bad teachers, but one that doesn't do the kind of damage that you're describing. And I'll give you an example again from Montgomery County. What Montgomery County did, uh, and the union, pretty strong union there, signed off on this, was they put together a panel, half teachers, half principals. And when bad teachers were identified, the first strategy was to love bomb them with everything you could give them, support, mentoring, outside, you know, outside courses, whatever they needed. And if they still were bad teachers by the agreed upon metric, these guys would say, you're done. This is not the profession for you. That's a whole lot better because it says, we're gonna, this is a professional decision and it's gonna get made by professionals not we're going to make it by the numbers, right? Because failing, in the sense that we're talking about failing, you know, means two test scores for each of those grades. That's the, that's the metric of, of failing. And th there are so many things wrong with the way those statistics are used to measure fail and success. Um, I, the, the one that I would sort of offer up is that you can predict the performance of a fourth grade teacher by the success of a fifth grade teacher. This is statistically a fascinating phenomenon. It tells you something about the improbability of the test. A great teacher one year is going to be a terrible teacher the next year on those tests. That's also a very common phenomenon. If you think about my party planning example, and you think about the small numbers of kids you're talking about measuring effectiveness on, you know, one kid is a terrible day. And that has a big effect on the, on the schools. But that, focusing on that metric and thinking that punishment is the way to proceed is unfortunately the sort of common metric and it sort of takes you to the world of let's do let's have competition let's have turnaround schools let's close schools open new schools and what troubles me about that is that the people who make those arguments say they're relying on data but they're not they're relying on a theory the market is a theory it's a good theory it it serves us very well in many areas of the, of the country we have no data to say that turnaround schools do any better than the schools that they preceded. In fact, we have some, some data to suggest that they create confusion along the way. So the larger problem to me, and I'll stop here, is the distrust problem. And I think teachers are partly responsible for creating the trust problem. Bad unions are partly responsible for creating the trust problem. Provocateurs from various outside sort of groups that make their living doing this, you know, are responsible when, when when Chris Christie in New Jersey talked about uh, teachers as turning the students into drug mules because they were bringing home materials about it. I mean, that's, that's really you know, an abusive way to talk about teachers, but it's, it's fueling the, the fire. 
The way to push back is to show that there are really good things going on. And the way to push back is for everybody to remember is that, you know, that this is all about the kids. I mean, nobody got into this to get rich or to get powerful or whatever. It's for the kids. And if you work your way back up there, there's no reason why the business community shouldn't be a really important partner in the process. But there's no reason why, because they care. Parents care. Teachers care. They ought to be engaged in this, in this story. Let's get another question. Hi, uh, I work for Breakthrough Schools here in Cleveland. I'm also a Master's of Public Policy student, and I study a lot about education policy, and I'm curious your opinion. It seems like the education reform for the last few decades have uh, the best policies or the most promising policies have only been adopted by districts or cities when they face a crisis like state receivership or mayoral con prospect of mayoral control. Are, is the country destined to wait for a moment of crisis before schools start looking at reforms or looking at implementing effective policies? And if they're not, then what's another catalyst that uh, could promote that? Well, I think about, it's a great question. Um, it's a reminder that you know, this, isn't, this wasn't just smooth sailing in many places. But in Aldine, Texas, a place that my guess is very few of you have heard of, it's Houston's poor cousin. There's more students than Washington, D.C., more students than Boston. Spend $7,800 student. So for folks, folks who are poor mouthing the schools in Cleveland, go to Aldine where you go to the superintendent's office, you pay a quarter for a cup of coffee. Um, <laughs> there, the business community said to the schools, we can't hire your graduates. They don't know how to read. They don't know how to write. They can't do math. I mean, that's a, that's a, a way in which issues arise. Um, the teachers union in a, in a farm town called Sanger, California, was so hostile to the school system, they had a billboard outside of town. Prospective teachers, drive on through. This town is hostile to teachers, right? That's a pretty tough, you go there 10 years down the road, it's not as though it was an easy overnight, trust me, change. But there's now a connection that exists, and that connection has enabled that community to build a good school system. What happens is what I'd call a, a kind of virtuous circle. It's a community, and Montgomery County is an example that runs through superintendents. New superintendent comes in and says, here's, my, here's what I propose to be able to do during the first few years that I'm here. Here's all that I can do. And it isn't a miracle. And the school district school board says, okay. And then they, two years, he's met his target. They say, oh, that's great. We have more confidence in you. And then more happens and more trust is generated. And everybody benefits. The kids benefit, the superintendent benefits, the politicians benefit because they've got something to be proud of. You don't have this impatience story. Impatience is the killer. You know, at the school or school district level, somebody comes along and says, here's a fancy new program. We're going to give you money for this for two years. We want you to file monthly reports. And then we're gone. Don't take it. I realize it's possible advice. Don't take the money. It's a diversion. It's costly in terms of energy. It's costly in terms of morale. The average urban school superintendent lasts about three years on the job. And I don't care if you've won a MacArthur Genius Award. You can't do it in three years. I think the, the response to improbable scholars from a lot of school districts, a lot of communities, is that you know, people had the sense that there was something, there was a lot of value that was going on, but they hadn't been able to grasp the whole of it. And I do think you get more and more places that are in fact doing good work. You know, places like Gardena, California, another D Long Beach, California, that don't get the press because, you know, you don't have Michelle Rhee, there Michelle Rhee on the cover of, you know, the New York Times Magazine with a broom sweeping out the terrible teachers. You don't have drama. You just have folks doing the job. So I think this is, this is, a, this is a viral story. American, American policy folks in education always dreamed of the one best system. You know, they looked to France and they said, this is really cool. The education minister is, says X and all of a sudden X happens across the country. This is not America. It's not going to happen. Cleveland will do something that works for Cleveland and it will look different from what another city that's demographically similar would do just because of the culture and traditions of the place. But to get people focused on 
going back to what works? I don't think it's hard. I don't get, I don't get a lot of pushback from folks. You know, I don't get people saying, this is a crazy idea, and nobody will ever do this. And that's encouraging, because as you say, we have lurched from crisis to crisis. So I harbor no illusions that you know, this book is going to produce instant conversion experiences. But I think this set of ideas is going to influence, is influencing the conversation. Next question. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. And I haven't read the book, and maybe the subject I'm about to bring up will be in that. And that has to do with families. Uh, we've mm -hmm. all come to understand, at least I'm sure, half of my children's success is because of the family he, they were from. But how were the families? I'm sure in, it's 100%. 100? <laughs> how were the families involved, especially with the language problems? No, it's a great, that's a great question. And it, it go, if we go back to the late 80s, when this district was a terrible district. The Latino kids it had then, many of them were Cuban kids, you know, who came from families, you know, merchant families, professional families. Very different now, by the way. The, the, the kids who are there now are from poor rural farming communities with uneducated parents from scattered across Latin America. Um, in the 80s, the school system still thought it was educating Irish and German kids, and the way it sort of <laughs> behaved that way was there was no decent bilingual education. You know, when there were going to be, you know, assemblies, parents' assemblies, the notices went out in English, everything was done in English. Surprise, surprise, the parents were turned off. They didn't, you know, if they could save up the pennies, they went to parochial schools. Um, and the, the shift is, in good part, uh, through bringing in at each school a community liaison person who connects to the community. Now, that, that choice is really important. All too often, the community liaison is a political hack who's appointed to satisfy, you know, a mayor's political obligation. Union City was very clear that the people who it hired for those jobs have in their heads the Rolodex of every kind of service that parents could want. So it's not just, you know, your kid is doing badly, let's talk about that. It is, you know, the parent comes in and says, I can't afford a new winter coat, or I need help getting into a GED class, or doing the paperwork to get a green card, or, and it's not as though the, the person who's in that, that, that job, the community liaison, has got to look it up. She knows who to call. You know, tell her that Rosa sent you. And that creates a real reciprocity in these, in these families. These are families, they're very poor. They are working all the time. They're working odd hours. And so the teachers will say to the families, you've got to share the responsibility for teaching your kids. And I sat through one of those discussions, and this mom said, I'd love to, but I'm never home when my child is awake. And so she went through her day, hour by hour, and it turned out there was 20 minutes when the mom and the daughter were on the bus together, the daughter's being dropped off at home and mom is going to work, that's when you can do reading together. Very serious about making that happen. And the proof to me of the pudding was, the first, poor schools have a hard time getting parents engaged. And I don't have to tell those of you who worked in, in, in urban school systems here and, and elsewhere. So the first parents meeting is about four weeks into the term. It's a day that is so raining, so rainy, that an umbrella is useless. They're just going to collapse and blow away. And I thought, nobody's going to show up. And the auditorium was packed. The best guess was that about 90% of the kids had somebody there. A mom, a dad, a tia, an abuela, you know, a family friend, somebody there for the kids. And the principal stands up and says, is there anybody here who doesn't speak Spanish? And a handful of hands went up, and so everything is done in English and Spanish. You don't want to commit the same mistake going the other way. And she got a big round of applause when the, the community liaison person, Maria Kanick, stands up. The house just went wild, because she really was their person. It's a very important part of the story. It was also important that the mayor, who really, you know, he has more community meetings than, I mean, he, his, he's got in his head, I'm going to bet, 1,500 phone numbers. He can tell you who used to live in that apartment that you're driving past 25 years ago, or what store used to be at that, that corner. He pushes the importance of education wherever he goes. And that matters a lot as well, because that's a different kind of example that's being set. So you're absolutely right. Community, community is, is crucial. It's hard to make happen. There is at least one school district that I talk about in the book, which actually borrowed the Union City playbook, which is not what other places have done. It brought folks from Union City 
the one thing they couldn't do was to get parents engaged. Still, the students did better. So it oughtn't, I, I don't want my remarks to suggest that, gosh, if you can't get parents involved, then throw up your hands, it's, it's hopeless. But I do want to say with you that it is vital that you do everything that you can to make that. And that means reaching out, means going to houses, it means getting a sense, and, and not just picking those times when kids are in trouble, but picking the times when kids have done great things to pay attention to families. Let's get another question. We constantly see in the media lists of achievement in language and math and what have you, and the United States is being compared to Singapore, Hong Kong, you name it, and generally we're pretty far down the list. Two questions. Number one, how much credibility should we give to those reports? And secondly, are there uh, systems in other countries that really have something that we should try to emulate? So I think we, we over, overemphasize what those comparisons look like. The populations are going to be different in nature. For example, a lot of the, the, the number one scoring entity is Shanghai. Shanghai is a pretty diverse city, actually. But when you look at who actually took the tests in Shanghai, it turns out to be not everybody in that, in that community. Having said that, you know, there's no doubt that the results of these tests are things we ought to pay attention to. There's just a new story out about another, an additional subsection of those tests which involves problem solving and creative thinking. We do better, but, you know, it's, you know the, the fallback used to be, oh, Singapore, China, they just memorize everything. Those places did better yet than, than, than we did. So here's the irony. The folks who, who tell us how terrible the public schools are and use the world, word while, com worldwide comparisons, you know, that you look to every one of these countries, Singapore, you know, Hong Kong, um, Finland, the Scandinavian countries, Japan, they have heavily centralized public school systems. And the one place that, that, that moved away from that, Sweden, is going back. They regard the market system as a failure. So you can make of that what you will. But they really, you're, if you're sitting in that ministry in France or that ministry in Tokyo, you get to decide what the best program is. I, that's, that's not going to work here. It shouldn't work here. But let a thousand flowers bloom is not going to work either. So my view of charter schools is the same as my view of, of tests. There are great charter schools. There are terrible charter schools. On the whole, charter schools are neither better nor worse, the data will show you, than public schools. Um, the worst ones are horrific in a way that public schools aren't. The best ones are brilliant in the way that few great public schools are. We have 62 million kids out there in the world. 62 million kids, three and a half million teachers. You can't charterize American education. You can't charterize Cleveland education. It ought to be an important component of what's going on. And on that subject, an, an, a little provocation. So I was talking with an administrator today, a, a district administrator, and I asked her about enrollment because the city apparently has kept open a lot of schools despite the declining enrollment and it's a whole set of issues that I won't wander into. They she also said, closed a lot. Yeah, okay. To be fair. Oh, okay. This is not what she said. So I'm, this is my, my one data point. But she said, you know, we're losing students to the charter schools. We've got to do what we can to get them back. And I thought charter schools were originally supposed to be lab schools. They were the places that tried out new ideas. And if they worked, they could be adopted by the public school system. For these days, her reaction is the standard reaction of public school officials, and charter school leaders return the compliment. So insofar as charter schools are a major fixture in Cleveland school reform, if they do not work closely with the public schools in the neighborhood, if they don't see themselves as compliments and, and, and not competition, the 50% graduation rate is not going to change. So you've got to build up the public schools, and that's the Union City story. No charters in Union City, not because anybody turned them down, nobody wanted them. The parochial school actually closed down because folks wanted to be in the public schools. I'm not suggesting that that's a good idea. I think charter schools will work really well in cities that have a, a tradition of charter schools, but they need to be connected, deliberately, intentionally connected. The approval process should include in it 
a plan to work with the public schools in that area. Every now and then in Cleveland, people talk about, start talking about good schools, and we need to talk about more about just good schools and bad schools, not charter schools and traditional schools. And no matter how many times people say that, it, it doesn't seem to take, at least not yet. Right. We've got another question somewhere, I think. I'd like to uh, return to this issue of family, parents. Uh, in this uh, process, shouldn't we be teaching parents how to be parents, number one? Absolutely. And also, we have examples of certain ethnic groups in this country, for instance, Asian American, Indian Americans, where the kids, in general, are very good at school. Can't we learn what they're doing right, and can we teach that to, the, to our parents? And I think a lot of parents and grandparents would like to help, they just don't know how to do it. Let so a if thousand you, tiger mothers bloom. Yeah, if you... If you <laughs> So this is my chance to plug Kids First, because I wrote Kids First, and I served on the Obama transition team, and there were hundreds of groups that wanted to talk to us about this program and that program, and I'm a policy guy, so I wanted to look at systems of support that would, that would take children from birth, cradle, to college. What could we do? What are the basic things that kids need? And the first of them is strong parenting support. There's a great program that I describe in this book called Triple P. It has a big database, and it's a population-based public health program. It doesn't look family by family. It looks city by city. So the data in this country doesn't compare 100 families here and 100 families there. It compares 11 rural South Carolina counties with 11 other rural South Carolina counties. Sydney, Australia, Brisbane, Australia. Very affordable program. When I said, don't get excited about, don't believe that pre-K is the answer, that's really where I was going, and thank you for, for giving me the teeing up that, that question. You've got to do, you've got to work on those, on those programs, and there are programs out there you know, that, that have really strong evidence bases showing parents. Every parent wants to be better than they are. No parent has all the answers. And if you're with other parents, as this program invites you to be, and there's a smart set of strategies, it's great. The book he was referring to is Kids, Kids First. It's got five big ideas, all of which are worth reading. <laughs> so too is the other book, Improbable Scholars. The author is David Kerp. Thank you very much for your time, David. Thank you. It's absolutely Appreciate wonderful. It. Today at the City Club, we've been listening to a Friday forum featuring David Kerr, professor at the Goldman School of Public Policy at the University of California, Berkeley. Thank you, Mr. Kerp. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This program is now adjourned. Go Tribe! <laughs> <laughs>